Urban Ministries presents. And now. We present to you. Amplifying the voice of God to all people. Hearing the cry of the lost. Broken and discouraged. Listen as a roundtable discussion panel covering various topics within the body of Christ. This, 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 this is Listen Radio. All right, hello everyone. As promised, we are going to continue this series about the history of Christianity and its ancient ties to paganism. And um, I know we talk about this, you know, in the other two series um, about the fact that a lot of people might be shocked that the traditions of Christianity and the religion or the religious practice of Christianity has its roots in paganism. Um, that does not mean that the worship of the one true God, uh, Yahweh, Yahuwah, is pagan, but the religion that emerged over time after the first advent of Christ became entrenched and connected to paganism. So we're going to continue talking about that today. If you haven't done so already, I would appreciate a like, a share, and also subscribe to the channel. We're a new channel. Um, I'm doing this because um, I have a ministry and we've taught some of these series that I, I'm doing right now, like this one right now that I'm doing. I've done this in my ministry before and we did a few others that Lord willing, I will also do videos on that and post them to the YouTube channel. But we did this uh, or I'm doing this because uh, I feel like a lot of the information needs to be shared with the body of Christ. And there's a lot of other channels out there that cover the same topics, cover the same information. But for some reason, it seems like the people that I know and that I'm close to and have connections to and we do ministry together, people in my community may not be aware of some of this information. And so people are asking, you know, well, could you share with us? Could you give us this information? And so, you know, my job is to first reach the people that are closest to me or the people that I, I know or, you know, old classmates or, or whatever the case may be. It's like, I want to share this information because I know so many people that love the Lord. They love the Messiah. They love Jesus. And they continue to live a life to serve him and worship him, but they become disenfranchised with Christianity. And um, my concern with people becoming disenfranchised with Christianity and the uh, information that's slowly leaking out there that, oh, you know, Christianity is pagan, is that people will begin to turn away from the faith. And if you don't know the roots of how we got to the religious practices of Christianity and how modern Christianity has evolved over time, then the enemy, the devil can use this information against against you and make you not want to serve God at all. So to avoid that, I want to put this information out there so that we can make a clear distinction between true worship to God. And I did a video on Facebook Live uh, about a week or so ago about true worship and the distinction between the customs and religious traditions that we've come to define as Christianity. Um, so you know, I've even put out on my website, commissionministries.com, that I don't even really like to refer myself as a refer to myself as a Christian. I prefer the term disciple or followers of the way. Um, now, of course, I still use that term because that is what most people are familiar with. When you say that, they automatically know what you mean. But if I were to have to pick a, a phrase or a word that really describes what it is that I'm doing according to the teachings of Yeshua, the teachings of Jesus, it would be a disciple because that's what he called his followers, disciples, you know, or as in the, the New Testament saints, the, the early church called themselves the followers of the way. So anyway, I said all that um, to say that if you haven't subscribed already, if you haven't liked the video, uh, please do so. And also leave a comment. If you have questions, put the comments in the comment section or email us, just message us, but we would definitely love to hear from you. And if you haven't watched the other uh, videos, then please, by all means, go back and watch the history of Christianity parts one and two. So the last time we, um, 
we're doing the videos, which is why it's important for you to go back and get the other two because I don't want to spend a lot of time reviewing, but because I'm, I'm kind of, I have that, that teacher thing in me. It's like, I'm going to do a little bit of review to catch you up. Um, but the other two videos will be best to go back and review them themselves. But the last time I left off, I was talking about, um, pagan goddess worship. And I believe that there is a, a connection between the prostitute in Revelation 17 or the whore of Babylon, I think is what the King James just flat out calls her, the whore of Babylon, uh, or the prostitute, I think is the New Living Translation. There's a connection between her and there's a connection between that and the Queen of Heaven. Um, and all going all the way back to, you know, some passages that we find in Jeremiah, uh, first and second Kings and Chronicles, how the children of Israel, the Hebrews were worshiping the gods that were around them. And so we can go all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia, go all the way back to Babylon and see how this organized system of belief began but not just the system of worship, it was also connected to the, um, the first worldwide attempt that we know of where mankind became unified in purpose and they built the Tower of Babel as a monument to themselves. And it was also centered around, you know, pagan worship and idolatry. And it's no mistake, I believe, that Revelation references Babylon is this world system that God is going to ultimately destroy in the end with the second advent of Christ, uh, the second coming of, of Yeshua HaMashiach. So like I said, go back and watch the other two videos to try to get that connection and what I'm talking about. And I did all of that and I began to talk about how the Catholic Church venerated Mary and they also gave her the title as the mother of God and also the queen of heaven. So I think it's really strange that the Bible talks about the queen of heaven and how the, the wives of, you know, the Hebrews would bake cakes to the queen of heaven and they were angry. And it's like, we're going to bake cakes to the queen of heaven and, and all of this kind of stuff. And it's like, God kept saying, he was telling Jeremiah, look, don't even weep for the people because they're going to continue to, to do this. Don't, don't weep for them. Don't pray for them because they're not going to repent of their idolatry and worshiping the different Baals, the queen of heaven, Tammuz, and all of these other, uh, pagan gods that are mentioned in the Bible. Um, but yet the Catholic church gave her the title of the queen of heaven. So I believe that the queen of heaven is also, uh, the woman that's described in revelation 17. Um, and that we're going to see that God will ultimately take that down. But before there is probably going to be a one world religious and economic system that will be accomplished in the earth and that everyone will be required to, re uh, worship the representative of this system. So, which will be the antichrist. So, um, yeah, so I'm sorry. Uh, and I went back in history and just showed you guys all the different goddesses that began in ancient Mesopotamia that have its roots in ancient Mesopotamia and how the different goddesses evolved. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the next slide. And I didn't have time um, to teach this last time, but I want to bring this up and bring this point home. So the last time I showed you guys this little crude chart that I made to show you the connection between the different goddesses. And one of the things that I mentioned last time is that I don't really, really believe that these goddesses or that the pagan gods, uh, are necessarily something entirely different. I believe that they are different in terms of the people who worship these different gods. I believe that the geographical location and the culture surrounding the worship of these gods makes it different. And of course the language makes it seem different, but there are similarities, which makes me believe that it is the same God or goddess, but the differences are found within the culture, uh, and the time and the location. So you can see Inanna and Astarte, Astarte and Ishtar 
are all basically the same goddess. Um, the languages and the names of them are different. One is Semitic, one is Sumerian, which is, um, I believe Sumeria was ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and then at another time it was Phoenicia. So these goddesses are the same. And then we go on to a different ge geographical locations. There's Oshun, there's Cybele, um, there's Mary, there's Sophia, and there's Rada. So it's like when you look at this chart, you see all of the similarities. And like I said, I won't go into the detail here, but I do want to show you another chart. So I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, and I'll probably try to remember to leave the link in the description box so that you can go and see it yourself. But uh, the Goddess Gift website um, has a, a not a chart, but a list of the different goddesses by category of what they're known for. And under that category are the different names of these different goddesses and what region um, they were worshipped in or the language of the people that worship these different goddesses. And so I highlighted some of this and you can see that Ashtoreth was the Philistine name for the goddess of fertility. So these are fertility goddesses. And there's Ashtoreth, Astarte, Diana, which is the Roman uh, goddess, Inanna, Sumerian, Ishtar, Mesopotamian, which um, Sumeria was part of Southern Mesopotamia. And then Ostara, which is Anglo-Saxon. Um, and then the good, good nurturing mothers, that list of goddesses are Asherah, which is a Canaanite goddess, Cybele. Um, there's Ishtar, there we go again, Mesopotamia, Isis, Egyptian, Magna Mater, Roman. So then we begin to see the, the Roman influence of deifying Mary as the great mother, which that's what Magna Mater means, the great mother. And it's a good nurturing mother, but it has these similarities and share these attributes with all of these other different goddesses. And like I said, I really don't believe that they're different. I just believe that over time and through different languages and cultures that we get different names of these goddesses and the different cultural practices that people uh, pull from their own culture in order to worship these different goddesses. So, um, so here, let's go back. Oh, let's move on to the next slide real quick. Okay. So uh, what, how does that even matter now? So the name of this whole series is about the history of Christianity. And I'm a really detailed person and I like to try to show people and go back as far as I can research, as far as we have record and evidence. And I, I like to pull together a narrative uh, based on things that we can examine and look at to answer some broader questions. Um, and when we talk about Christianity, of course, going all the way back to um, the religious practice upon which Christianity came out of, which is um, Judaism or the Judeo-Christian tradition, but more specifically, the the worship of the one true God by the Hebrew people, okay? So we go back and we look at the folly and the error of the Hebrew people in that they continue to worship other gods which is and goddesses, which is why um, they went into exile. Remember the, the 12 tribes went into exile, first the Northern Kingdom and the 10 tribes that lived in the Northern Kingdom fell to Assyria. And then uh, later the Southern Kingdom, which was, I believe Judah and Benjamin fell um, to Babylon. So they went into exile. And from that point on, I think the Southern Kingdom was allowed to return and rebuild the temple, but the, the, the nation of Israel was not the same from that point on. Uh, things began to change and it was all due to idolatry and the fact that they continued to worship other gods and God sent prophet after prophet, warning after warning, but they did not heed those warnings. So they were, you know, the one 
nation or group of people that God had called out. And there were other people that would worship the true God, but it was the one nation, God's special uh, people that were called out to worship him. But the rest of the ancient world continued to uh, engage in paganism and idolatry. And, you know, we'll wind up uh, moving all the way into the time of Christ. And I'll show that and go into the time of Rome to show how those things continued on. But if we look at modern times, we tend to think of America as a Christian nation. Um, people would be shocked to hear that we're not a Christian nation. As a matter of fact, I think Bishop T.D. Jakes said that America was not a Christian nation and people were upset when he said that. Um, I tend to agree with that statement for a lot of reasons. Number one, because our country was built on slavery, um, but it was also, Christianity was also used to justify the torture and torment and enslavement of a group of people for hundreds of years and America's wealth and everything and every industry has been touched by the legacy of slavery, but yet Christianity was um, something that was used to justify and so was uh, imperialism um, was used for the idea of God and glory and gold. You know, so when you think about the fact that Christianity was the primary uh, justification for such inhumanity and such cruelty, um, how can those two things coexist? Well, it's because my, my opinion is that Christianity has its roots in some things that are not necessarily godly. Yes, it may have been based on the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but then over time, the, um, the cultural practices and the beliefs and the theology that was formed uh, was not based on the God of the Bible and the teachings of Christ, but it was uh, connected to a great deal of paganism, which I'll show later. But like I said, when we think in terms of modern day, and how does this relate? You know, why are we talking about this? Well, uh, what used to be something that was more hidden is now becoming uh, something that is more prominent and more prevalent and that people are openly practicing paganism. Um, and of course, we've seen that in the last, you know, 50, 60 years that, you know, the practice of Wicca um, and voodoo and all of these other things ha have been uh, no secret but at the same time, uh, it was a subculture or we would consider it to be a subculture or even a counterculture. But now it is moving more into the mainstream as evidenced by a lot of the television shows that we see, you know, uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And I mean, I'm probably dating myself because I've never really watched any of those shows. But there's a lot of shows on television that, um, that are about the occult. I mean, there's a TV show called Lucifer. There's um, a series called The American Gods, um, which I'll reference in another teaching at some point in time. So it's like the culture of paganism is right there in our faces. It's in our movies. It's in our entertainment. But because it's entertainment and we were taught Greek mythology in school, it was a part of our public education. Imagine that that we learned about Greek mythology, we don't really bat an eye or think twice about it. But now we're moving into an era where paganism is on the rise. And, um, you know, Christianity as a practice and as the mainstream uh, religious theology that kind of holds us together is dwindling. So I'm just going to look at this real quick and show you all this article by this website called Ancient Origins, con reconstructing, reconstructing the story of humanity's past. And some may ask the question, well, why are you on this, you know, website or whatever? Because it's kind of an impartial website. It doesn't really care what religion, um, you know, it, it's not really partial because I think they may even have some in, in, um, information about Christianity here. Um, but just trying to look and see what people say about paganism and this article was written in July and back in 2018 so about two years ago at this point and it's called the return of the ancient gods the resurgence of paganism 
And it just says over the past two centuries, Europe has become increasingly secular. Scholars, in fact, no longer talk of the Christian West when they speak of modern Europe and North America, but of the secular West. There is evidence. There is, however, evidence of a spiritual revival stirring on the continent where God is supposedly dead. Old traditions predating the appearance of the Jewish carpenter turned Messiah are beginning to reemerge. Uh, since the 19th century, there has been an increasing interest interest in ancient pre-Christian European religions such as ancient Greek, Germanic, Celtic, and Slavic paganism. This stems from an increasing interest in spirituality in Europe, specifically a spirituality in touch um, with European heritage and ethnic roots in a similar manner to indigenous religions of Native Americans and Aboriginal Australians. So basically, it's saying that in Europe and North America, there is a resurgence of paganism that is honoring the old pagan systems. Um, but like we've talked about in the history of Christianity, it goes even back further than when the descendants of Japheth traveled north uh, and established European nations and, and, and ethnic groups and tribes and so on and so forth. Um, they took all of that with them. You know, if we were to go back and if we were able to trace back I would imagine that we would be able to find that some of these same belief systems, you know, traveled with them and they morphed, you know, over time. And, and who knows, you know, I, I don't really know because the scripture does tell the, tell us that these gods are basically deeming, demons that are stealing worship from mankind. So maybe they perhaps met new demons, I don't know, and created these new gods. I, I haven't really looked into the folklore of how they came to worship some of these other gods, but we know that paganism is not native or uh, began with European settlement in the Northern uh, Hemisphere, but we know that it's very ancient and it's much older than that. But Europe and North America is returning to some of these old gods. And so ancient and modern combinations. So among modern pagans, there are two approaches to reviving pagan practices. One is eclecticism or yeah, eclecticism or syncretism in which elements of historical ethnic religions such as the ancient Norse religion are combined with modern movements such as Wicca, theosophy, or other new age philosophies. So scrolling down, just kind of just scroll into this in Iceland, the Norse gods are making a particularly strong comeback in Nordic paganism is now Iceland's fastest growing religion. So where did I see this? But you guys are probably familiar with some of these Norse gods, Odin. Yeah, Denmark too completed a pagan temple dedicated to Odin for the first time in a millennium in 2016. So that's part of like the, um, what is it? Marvel comics. Um, and some of those, uh, you know, blockbuster movies that we get every summer, Thor, Odin. All of that, that, that's part of the Marvel, Marvel Comics um, characters. And it's based on these pagan gods. And so we're just all up in the movie theaters with our popcorn, <laughs> you know, spending our money, taking our kids to go see this thing. Yeah, it is entertaining. But for us, it's entertainment. But for some people, this is real. This is a real custom practice and belief. And remember, I told y'all at the beginning of this whole series that Paganism is the elder faith. It may be shocking to hear, but paganism is the elder faith in that it was the oldest form of organized systems of belief. Belief in Yahweh predates paganism, but it wasn't shortly after mankind began to multiply that they began to worship other gods because we know that Satan was in the garden tempting Adam and Eve. So as early as we can see Satan's influence in, um, in the history of God's people, we know that paganism um, existed right alongside with it. And there's always been this competition between God and Satan. Um, so they talk about Germanic paganism uh, with elves and trolls and, and Thor and Odin and Slavic paganism. And so just basically going through this list and it's talking about the, the Greek gods, uh, 
we're more familiar with those Zeus, Apollo, Artemis, Hera, Athena, Aphrodite, Demeter, Hermes, so on and so forth. Um, and that's going to be important when we begin to look at uh, the history of Rome um, and its influence in the rise of Christianity and the morphing and melding into the two belief systems. Um, and so I just thought this was really interesting um, because um, I, I don't want people to be deceived into thinking that America is a Christian nation that there's all kinds of belief systems and there's a great deal of esotericism. Uh, I think I'm saying that right. Esoteric, esotericism. Yeah, there's a great deal of esotericism that we are exposed to um, through popular culture and many different other signs and symbols. And that's a, a chief way that esoteric beliefs communicate through signs and symbols. You guys remember that movie with Tom Hanks? What was it called? See, don't get me to like start messing stuff up, but, um, yeah, I forget the name of the stupid movie, but Tom Hanks, that movie about the Catholic church and all the signs and the symbols, he was, a um, an expert in, an expert in semiotics. So, I mean, I, I, we see this stuff and it's right there in our faces, but for those who are not initiated or part of the cult or the pagan practices, you're the uninitiated. So you don't you're not able to interpret the signs and the symbols, but for those who practice it, it is a way that they communicate and they understand what these signs and these symbols mean. So we need to become more aware of what we're looking at and realize that we are in a nation that really is probably more um, pluralist or practices secretism, which is a mixture, you know, of different beliefs than we are a Christian nation. But that doesn't mean that just because we live in a nation that is disguised as Christian, that we cannot still worship the one true God and worship his son, Jesus Christ. We just need to have an understanding of what we're dealing with and what we're being taught and what we have been taught and to break free from some of the old ways of thinkings, thinking when it comes to Christianity and religion and what all that means. And that is part of the reason why I'm doing this series is to point us to history so that we can understand how we got here and how we can break away from it. So this slide is actually leading up to the next series that I'm going to do or the next um, the next episode in the series because I'm in no way going to begin to cover uh, how pagan Rome survived but we are going to look at how pagan Rome survived we're going to look at the dec decline of Western Rome and the rise of Eastern Rome or what we know as Byzantium okay but in the meantime I want to just kind of give this teaser because of course we think of Rome as something that is part of our world history class, something that you took uh, in high school or middle school. What do they teach us in high school? Is it For us, I'm from Texas. So look, they indoctrinate us really early with Texas history. I don't know if they do that in other states, but we're pretty, <laughs> we're pretty indoctrinated here in Texas. We, we bleed Texas. You know, we sing Texas, uh, we have tortilla chips in the shape of Texas, right? We have, oh man, I mean, it, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. So it's like we learn Texas history in middle school. So I think that by the time we get to world history, um, that's probably high school or whatever the case may be, I digress. But uh, we think of Rome as being something that is locked in the pages of history. But I, I want to make the case that Rome didn't actually fall and die, but it survived in a different form. So just to prove that, so I'm gonna go forward into current times, uh, or I would say within the last 60 or 70 years, I wanna go current into the last 60, 70 years and up until recent times, and then I'll go back into history to prove that I believe that what we see now is a continuation of Rome. And I'm going to do that by pointing out something. 
Okay, I'm waiting for this to open. Ooh, I was hoping that it would open. And it's taken all day. Of course it's taken all day. Okay, oof, I was getting a little nervous. So, em Emmanuel Macron um, <laughs> calls for a true European army and is a prelude to Armageddon. And this is on this website called Lines and Precepts. Um, let's see. Well, this is today's date, but this is an old article. So, on Monday, November 6, 2018, Emmanuel Macron called for the creation of a true European army to allow the EU to defend itself from threats ranging from Donald Trump, Trump to Vladimir Putin. The French president has pushed for closer EU defense union since coming to power last year, but has been so far met with limited success amid foot dragging by other member states. So now the EU is a thing. The European Union is something that we're familiar with. Um, so the e European Union is not the news. It's the idea that this uh, French president is asking for a European army to go along with the European Union. So what is the European Union and what does that have to do with Rome? Okay. So there is something that's called the Treaty of Rome and the European Union is largely based on a series of treaties that were signed that created the European Union. So the Treaty of Rome, um, or officially the, the Treaty Establishing the European Economic Community or EEC, in short, brought about the creation of the European Economic Community, best known of the European communities and it was signed in 1957 by Belgium, France, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and West Germany, and came into force on January 1st, 1958, under the name of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. It remains one of the two most important treaties in the modern day European Union. And this is according to Wikipedia. So France was one of those nations that initially signed these different treaties that became known as the Treaty of Rome, which is an important treaty in the forming of the U European Union, which at this point now, the European Union, I think stands about 26 or 27 countries strong. Uh, and the belief in this union is that, you know, if all of these different European countries are united, then war among them would be nearly impossible and war against them would also be as equally as impossible. So which is why he's calling for a unified army because he believes that the outside threats to the European Union uh, or modern day Rome, if we're gonna call it the Treaty of Rome, which I think is interesting that in 1957, where there is no uh, ancient Rome that we, we know about it because Rome used to be a superpower and that's what I'm getting at is this idea that Rome used to be this superpower uh, and is no more, but now there is a treaty of Rome, right? So very interesting uh, turn of events. Um, you know, I, I'm not a great historian. I'm not someone that follows a whole, whole, whole lot of news, but you know, you, you hear things and without context surrounding some of this information, you're really not able to put the pieces together. So what I'm hoping that I'm able to do is to provide some context, to put some pieces together uh, and create a narrative so that we can ask questions. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on any of this information, but I'm just somebody who is a student of the Bible. I'm somebody who believes that we cannot simply use the scriptures alone to help us understand the current world we live in uh, without the context of history, without the context of political uh, events and historical events that shape our nations, that shape government policies, that shape the rise and fall of nations, that shape um, the different reasons why some people are oppressed and why nations rise and fall and why the economy the way that it is. 
Because if we're going to get all the way down to the time of revelation and we're going to see a world system created, then we have to be following politics, geopolitics in particular, and we have to know the context of history and how that all plays into religion because you can track all of those things together the rise and fall of nations and the religious practices that were surrounding these nations so um that's about all that i have for this particular uh episode in the series of christianity and like i said uh if you haven't done so already go back uh and look at the other two videos like comment please subscribe and share definitely share 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 um you know so that we can be informed um as believers i really believe that we can break free from the traditions that we've been taught by understanding the history surrounding these things and to really know you know how we got here it's like why do we celebrate easter you know why do we celebrate christmas why 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 do we do these things when they have nothing to do with uh with jesus they have nothing to do with the text with the bible they have nothing to do with any of those things and why are people becoming frustrated and wanting to leave the church well i don't want you to leave the church which is the body of christ you can leave the building but you don't have to leave the body of christ the ecclesia the called out ones uh the ones who are connected to jesus christ and to salvation that he has so richly provided for us we don't have to leave the faith in order to truly worship jesus but we do have to take a good long hard look at how we got to some of these traditions and and how we can prepare ourselves and not be deceived uh in the days ahead uh because there are difficult days in ahead right now we are in the middle of a global pandemic and i know there's a lot of theories surrounding what people will choose to believe it doesn't really matter um what we choose to believe about this pandemic the one thing that we do know is that the results of this pandemic we're living through the results we are being asked to stay at home we do have reports of people saying that their loved ones have passed away and they've gotten sick um that you know that if no one in your family has passed away we know someone that knows someone that's close to us so we're seeing the results of this and we know that there are earthquakes in various places um that in the horn of africa and um oh gosh where else um somewhere in the middle east they're dealing with uh, locust locust plagues so and with there's talk of um a food shortage as a result of the supply chains being halted because of this pandemic so whether you want to believe it or not the results of what we're living through are real and they are going to change the course of history from this point on um and so while we have time as believers to get information to each other and to study the word uh and to be prepared then we need to you know do a crash course on learning about the faith and being prepared so i feel like i'm repeating myself so on that note um stay tuned for the next video hopefully i'll be able to have it up for by next week for you guys and so stay tuned i love you god bless you i'm out